Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll take the floor to uh, kick off this session on uh, assessing hate speech and self-regulation, who and how. Um, I'm expecting some people still to drop in, but I'll take that time to quickly uh, introduce myself and the setup of the session um, so that you can also check if you're in the right room. Uh, so you can still flee to another one if there's a need. Um, I'm Menno Itema, I work for the Council of Europe at the Anti-Discrimination Department and I'm very happy that we have this session to look into the challenges of assessing and taking action on hate speech um, and how to do that. And one of the models that are being uh, advocated for lately is self-regulation. But the question is, what is that then? How does that work and how does that, uh, what kind of models could be put in place that actually uh, work and address the needs of the user? the needs of the internet industry, but also the needs of a democratic, especially I would say the needs of a democratic society. So I'm joined here by a, a, a group of, uh, uh, well, officially they're called panelists, but I would say uh, co-speakers. I'm also inviting you to join in the discussions along the way in this hour that we have. Um, but we are joined here by uh, Jeremy uh, McBride, who is a consultant for uh, ECRI, the European Commission Against Racism and Tolerance of the Council of Europe, and a major contributor or writer, I would say, to uh, ECRI's general policy recommendation number 15 on combating hate speech. I'm also joined by uh, Thomas, um, Thomas uh, Donbass, uh, who is board member of Hatter Society. Uh, from Hungary, and I'll leave it to you to explain a little bit the uh, organization. Um, I'm joined here by um, Antonio um, Battisti. Yeah. Yes, I got it correctly. Uh, head of the policy, head of policy from Facebook uh, France, and on the, the far end, Miriam uh, Estrin, policy manager for Europe, Middle East, and Africa at Google. Um, I'm also joined here, I think, by representatives of NGOs, various other industries, hopefully of governments, and we're joined uh, online uh, through web chaining, web streaming on YouTube. Uh, so I also invite those who are watching online to contribute through the uh, speakers queue cell. Some technical things that I was asked to um, convey to you. If you have a phone like myself, please don't use it, put it on the table unless you need it like me to check the time. Uh, because if it vibrates, it is picked up by the microphone. And also, if you could leave the microphones where they are, because they make a lot of noise, and the people across the world that are listening through headphones will probably go deaf. I'm exaggerating, maybe, but this was a little bit the tender of the discussion. Um, the session, the setup will be that um, I will give the floor to Jeremy uh, shortly to describe a little bit the context of this uh, session. What are we, why is the session here? Uh, what are the concerns or issues or recommendations that are out there that we could uh, take in? Um, which hopefully starts you thinking. Um, then I will pop a question to you about self-regulation and hate speech in your perspectives which I would like to try to collect um, together and then ask the, our, our, my colleagues to, to take them up, respond to that, and also to invite you to further elaborate your, 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 your thoughts on self-regulation and hate speech. So that's a little bit the setup. We have an hour. It's tight. So I'm hoping that this is actually a kickoff for a more longer discussion um, on, around this new development uh, and call for self-regulation. Okay, that's the setup. I then give the floor to Jeremy, maybe to explain why you are here and what's the context of this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Menno. Um, well, the basic reason we're here is, of course, the increasing problem or the recognition there's an increasing problem of the use of hate speech um, and the need is in some way to tackle it. Um, there are various possibilities. What, what we're seeing beginning to emerge is the idea of criminalizing in some instances the use of hate speech, uh, the imposition of uh, financial penalties of various kinds. Um, but the, that isn't the only possibility. I'm, I'm a lawyer and um, generally I think in terms of, of courts, but that isn't necessarily the most effective way from the point of view of people who are affected by the use of hate speech. And that's why the, the issue of self-regulation, I think, becomes important. And you see this being brought forward in a variety of ways, so that you have, if you look at the 
general policy recommendation of ECRI, which was mentioned earlier, although that does envisage um, the possibility of civil and criminal liability for the use of hate speech, it's very much framed in terms of seeing that as a last resort, instead um, ways of trying to prevent hate speech um, through education and where it's used to encourage the use of self-regulation by those who are able to facilitate or actually also use it. So, for example, in the context of parliaments, you have the issue of parliamentarians themselves regulating themselves to prevent the use of that. Um, the, the recommendation, like uh, various initiatives also by the European Union in terms of uh, developing a code of conduct uh, with those internet providers, uh, more recently with a European Commission recommendation, uh, and also with legislation in countries including Germany, uh, there is a push to encourage self-regulation. Now, first is what does self-regulation mean, and secondly, why, why is it valuable? Well, the first thing is that, that you have to have some standards which you expect to to adopt, generally people talk in terms of a code of conduct. You need some arrangement for monitoring the way in which material is, is made available, um, possibly some facilities for restricting it, for example, content bots um, as a means of preventing it, um, but also encouraging uh, the possibility of complaints and some, therefore, response as a result of people from outside um, the, the organization which is facilitating the use of the material, uh, being alerted to the problem and then possibly taking action. The reason why self-regulation is seen as desirable insofar as it works, and that, that's a question of how we will come back to, I'm sure, um, is first of all, there is considerable concern that if you start going to courts, you may have too readily an interference with freedom of expression, which is an important value, which what is to be balanced with the, the, the interest of hate speech. Uh, secondly, I think it's important because it provides a remedy potentially for those who are targeted by hate speech, and it does so in a manner which is much quicker than going to court. I mean, court proceedings tend to take a long time, um, and moreover, court proceedings can be very expensive, so you have that advantage. And from the point of view of the operators of those who have internet services, um, it puts them in a position to ensure that they are legally compliant and avoid the risk possibly at a longer stage of significant penalties, um, and also ensures that um, there isn't undue disruption with the way in which they function, because if you can deal quickly with a problem, then you don't have long um, procedures which follow which may be costly and uh, also bad for reputation. So those are the main considerations which I think drive forward the, the idea of self-regulation. So I'll stop at that point. Yes, thank you very much. I think you're trying to set the frame of why the force and the balance for self-regulation. And I think you mentioned an important point which I would like to stress that there's more to be done against uh, the hate speech. I mean, policy recommendation addresses uh, preventive measures, but also last resort, which is the court. And I think the challenge here is to see, okay, self-regulation, what does that, um, what's the potential of that tool in the complete toolbox? So I think this session is particularly trying to look at that specific tool in the complete toolbox. Having said that, um, thank you for the short introduction, which hopefully started you reflecting on this question. Um, um, this is the moment to ask you actually to also get starting to think. I would like to ask you to look at your neighbour and maybe discuss with and try to discuss with the neighbour in one or two minutes um, what you think self-regulation, self-regulation, self thank you, <laughs> self-regulation for the internet industry on uh, assessing and taking action on hate speech should deliver. So what should it deliver? What's, why should self-regulation be there? What should it deliver for you? Um, so I give you one or two minutes to talk with your neighbor. Just reflect quickly. Quick, what is it about? What should it deliver, you think? And then I'll collapse your ideas. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's workable. Yes, thank you. Singing. Hello? Okay. <laughs> Active participation. Thank you for the clapping. <laughs> yes. I saw a little dip in sound, which normally means that people have finished a thought and then slowly start adding more. So that's normally the moment when I start uh, uh, grabbing everyone's attention. Um, I saw a lot of engagement, lots of talk, so I'm very curious. I would like to go around the room and collect some of your uh, responses to the question, what should self-regulation for the internet industry on assessing and taking action on hate speech deliver? Um, if you note, it, note that other people have already said what you were discussing, then please say it, uh, we had similar discussions so that we don't repeat the same point a few times. Um, so I would like to do a quick round just to get a little bit the feeling of the thoughts and ideas uh, among you. And then I'll we'll continue that discussion all together. Um, maybe ah, I see a hand, so I'll move this way around. So please, please use the mic. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rosine Kaku from Côte d'Ivoire. So with my partner, we talked about how we should be more, um, how we should report more offensive content when we are seeing it. Because most of the time when we are seeing hate speech or something like that, we just hide it. Because there is this option. So we have to report more. And if we are, for example, moderator of some group on, on Facebook or WhatsApp or whatever, we have to pay more attention to that and take um, and contact the, the actors of this hate speech to discuss with them and try to, to know why they are doing it and maybe try to sensitize them. Thank you. Thank you very much for active participation in reporting. Thank you. Can I go this way? We'll each cover one point. Um, so, uh, tell me about my Dangerous Speech Project. Uh, one thing that we discussed was uh, finding the right balance between um, you know, who, who do we trust more uh, in terms of, of regulation? Um, do we want governments to uh, be responsible for what people can and, and cannot say in the public square? Um, do we want companies to uh, have a, a massive secret uh, system of censorship? Um, and we think there's probably s some middle ground uh, that, that could be found um, that's more appropriate. And if it's okay, I'll mention our second point, which was um, we're, one question was, is there, are we witnessing more hate because there's actually more hate in society, or are we witnessing more hate because there's technologies out there that are better for empowering small groups with uh, socially unacceptable views uh, who are able to form, find each other and form associations and then publish free and use the Internet? So is it a question of technologically based empowerment, or is it a question of that there's more uh, hate in the, in the society? And that would inform possibly a response to hate speech, would you address questions of association and publication, or would you address uh, social issues of hate itself? Thank you. Thank you. So I came for it late, so I'm just going to say whatever we discussed very briefly. I think the question that I was trying to find answer during our brief discussion was that um, Self-regulation by the companies looks great on paper, but talking about countries like Pakistan, where they continue to pressure corporations to, you know, give in to the government demands, I think it 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 it, it doesn't seem practical for the for the corporations as well to do self-regulation and not listen to the government as well. So um, uh, the governments are always there to, you know, pressure uh, pressure Facebook and pressure other corporations to, you know, uh, take down content which is offensive religiously as well. So um, I'm not really sure what is the answer to this, but this is just a concern that, that, I, that I thought that should be addressed as well. Yeah, so it's about the independence <clears throat> and how far is that possible. Yes. Anything from this? Uh, Lucas from Brazil, just really quick. Uh, we discussed a little bit about contextualization. Um, hate speech is not the same everywhere, and also um, it's necessary to, for 
service providers to be attentive of even language differences uh, that might uh, create some nuances depending on where they, they act. Uh, these companies are global, so if they want to enact uh, global hate speech policies to, you know, to, to counter uh, hate speech, they should be aware of some regional differences that they might encounter uh, between their users. Thank you very much. I move down the line here. If there's any other new points that have not been mentioned, please, I would prefer to Thanks, uh, Mark of our UK government. Uh, we kind of launched into our um, you know, respective interests, in the, three of us actually <laughs> discussing this, in the topic of uh, hate speech. And the point I kind of led off on was the diffi difficulty of definition, and certainly from the government perspective what is not a crime to be hating something, but there might be ways of defining with the help of uh, the platforms and other intermediaries with responsibilities of assessing what, uh, where does hate speech progress into something that is uh, promoting a violent reaction in some way. So then it becomes a kind of criminal activity but the difficulty of defining that that's what I kind of led off on but uh, maybe uh, you want to add something or? No. Okay. Monica Ahmed. I'm a journalist observing but um, we had a nice conversation and, and talked about what forms of self-regulations we could consider at all self-regulation by the platforms self-regulation by the platforms while kind of obliged by the government, which is, would equate to what we say co-regulation or self-regulation by, by users in, 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 in essence. And then we, we tried to, to make a case and said, what, what would help against hate speech at the highest level, at, at the level of um, heads of state? Like, we circled on the President of the United States, so would you uh, rather reach uh, to, uh, can you have success against such kind of hate speech via regulation, self-regulation? Um, hello, uh, my colleague and I, uh, my colleague is from uh, Myanmar, I'm from Pakistan, and we started to uh, discuss what a model for uh, self-regulation lo would look like. And um, how uh, into uh, when we start sort of defining hate speech, so maybe if there is room for self-regulation for hate speech to only accommodate a sort of the legal definition to only accommodate the sort of top tier, and for it to acknowledge the fact that there is room for self-regulation as well. So sort of a rethinking of the way that we approach and define hate speech currently uh, would be a go good way to start. Yeah. Don Means, uh, the Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, we had two perspectives on this. Uh, one was, uh, of course, the definition is, uh, is a, a difficult one, and it's also not new. Uh, uh, it's uh, maybe one of scale uh, that has kind of disrupted everything, and, and one element of that is how much uh, has been automated, how much hate speech is robotic. Uh, that gives a wider impression of the, of the problem and certain kinds of things can be done related to making it more difficult to set up accounts in the first place that are, that are just for that purpose. Thank you. My name is Shafkat Sabirov uh, from uh, Internet Association of Kazakhstan. Uh, we know who we are, we are NGO, and we know how. Uh, we have a hotline for the last six years, we've got over 11,000 reports, uh, where uh, about 99% related to hate speech, resolved with 100% of reports of hate speech. For 2014, uh, hate speech reports comes to 49%. It means uh, crisis in Ukraine brought to us hate speech uh, reports increased maybe twice or tri triple times. So uh, our hotline, just to show that NGO can uh, get report from end users, 
and uh, can uh, resolve all cases what we have, for example. Thank you. Hi, my name is Orsha Yaguyash. I'm a researcher at the Institute for European Studies at the Prior University of Brussels. Um, I think what we've been discussing has been said about crowdsourcing solutions or just the contextuality um, of the problem and different attitudes uh, towards freedom of expression in different countries. Um, but I think you were, uh, if you want to speak a few words about uh, the problem itself, regulation itself. I'm Mike Nelson, I'm with Cloudflare, and we've been in the middle of several large debates about hate speech because our online computer security service protects a lot of speech from a lot of places, including some speech that people interpret as hate speech. Uh, we've tried to draw the line between hate speech and incitement, which is illegal when you're actually telling people to go out and hurt people and do damage. That's different than just a lot of what the Europeans define as hate speech. Um, I haven't heard anybody mention the First Amendment, but as an American, I have to. Uh, we do believe that the answer to bad speech is a lot more good speech, even if it requires repeating the bad speech and debunking it. <clears throat> the other thing we worry about is that deputizing commercial entities to filter the Internet will lead to overreaction. We've already seen this. And that will lead to censorship and suppression of new ideas. And perversely, it could lead to really bad people censoring good people by using these mechanisms to complain about speech that isn't hate speech, but the algorithms, the mechanisms these sites use could very well knock off content that is, is useful. So we have to watch that we don't <clears throat> go far beyond the intent here, which is to just deal with the extreme extremist speech and incitement. And we have to also realize that different countries have radically different approaches. So some global approach to self-regulation is going to be very hard. Thank you very much. There's already a many points uh, raised, and I'll try to grab them in a few minutes, but maybe there's a few more thoughts on the uh, second row there. Anything to add? Please. Okay, we were also considering the fact that um, if self-regulation happens, it should uh, take place in a concerted way in order to avoid that there are as many regulations as platforms. Um, hi. Uh, we were also talking about um, how the idea of educating people uh, about positive uh, communication styles and um, the skills that people need to develop more compassion and sympathy are also important in this sphere of self-regulation. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think a lot of points have been raised which I, uh, when we were preparing the session also crossed our minds. So I think it's, it's a good, a good um, hooks to continue the discussion. I mean, there were questions raised by you about, okay, the reporting actually needs active, uh, the active participation of the users itself, uh, which I think is something to reflect on. And there's a role of education here, for example, also to do when it comes to self-regulation, what are the challenges here of balancing who imposes, who initiates the self-regulation, how is that organized, the role of the companies, the role of the governments, um, risks of over-deleting because of legislation or requirements, uh, securing the balance between freedom of expression, non-discrimination, um, and things like that. Um, there's the challenge here of a globe, is there possibilities for a global approach while well, there's national legislation. Uh, yeah, precisely. The, f uh, the First Amendment comes here in, uh, just to repeat that one. And there's also the concerns here of like, okay, can we have a concerted approach that we don't have a self-regulatory per company and that also creates confusion with the users. Um, naturally, there's then the definitions of hate speech. What do we use? How do we keep in mind the context, language, regional concerns, etc.? So there's a lot of challenges here. Um, Voila. 
let's uh, bring it uh, to, to us and can I give the floor uh, to you to maybe respond to some of these points, add your own considerations um, and to recall the call for self-regulation is out there so let's have a look at what kind of models could actually work and that can we actually address some of the concerns that have been raised here and maybe you have your own concerns. Tomas, um, can I ask you to quickly introduce your background and uh, your contribution to the discussion? Um, Thank you for the floor and the invitation to talk. Uh, my name is Tomasz Dombos. I work for Hatter Society, which is a Hungarian NGO working on LGBTQI rights. We are oldest and the largest in the country, and we offer various services to members of the community, meaning uh, information and counseling, um, legal aid, as well as doing research and advocacy. Um, I'm here invited to talk a little bit about the target groups of hate speech, that is minority communities, vulnerable communities, and how they experience hate speech and what are their expectations around self-regulation and hate speech. I think as any other user, um, you, uh, members of these communities want a safe and welcoming environment when they go online. Uh, and if they meet uh, calls for beating, the, beat, in the, beating them up, deboweling them, burning them alive, if they meet that kind of content every day, then they will, be not, they will not be feeling safe and they will not be feeling welcomed. Um, of course, the best would be if such hate speech wouldn't happen at all, but that's very unlikely to happen. What, they, what these communities need is a collective response to these hate speeches to make it clear that the community as such and the platform as such is not welcoming these kinds of content. Um, now, how that collective response should happen is a big question. Um, I'll, give you another, I'll give you an example. If a same-sex couple walks into a restaurant and they are shouted by other guests at the restaurant, you dirty faggot, you're not welcomed here, you expect the restaurant to do something about it. You report it to the waiter and tell, you know, please tell those group uh, of people to stop shouting that because it's not nice. And if the waiter or the uh, manager at the restaurant doesn't do anything, then you expect the restaurant to be uh, uh, legally uh, responsible for their non-action. And I think that's the case also for social platforms, uh, for social media platforms. Uh, one form of self-regulation that is currently happening in Europe is the European Commission's Code of Conduct, which they signed with uh, social media companies back in 2016, in which these platforms agreed to assess reports in 24 hours, to remove illegal content that is illegal already according to national legislation, and to introduce a system of trusted flaggers, NGOs, that, whose reports are taken more seriously or in a, in a, in a more responsive way uh, by these companies. Now, the Commission is also doing a monitoring of how that uh, code of conduct is um, implemented in practice. So there are dozens of NGOs that every six months are reporting hundreds of content and assessing how the uh, companies are um, uh, taking uh, care of those reports. And the experiences are uh, quite mixed. Um, I would like to say when this, we are already uh, done three cycles of uh, monitoring and currently in the process of the fourth cycle and the, there is improvement. Uh, so when it was started, the 24-hour deadline was never met. Uh, content very often stayed online. Now there is more, um, uh, pro there has been progress made on that. However, there are still huge differences between the, the platforms that have already joined the company, uh, the, joined the uh, code of conduct. There are companies that are doing better and there are companies which are still lagging behind and uh, if you're interested I can name them but uh, maybe that's not what matters. There's also so huge differences within the same company in various countries. So for example in some countries the uh, companies are more responsive and in other companies they are not doing anything. So it seems like there is no globally uh, uh, consistent ways of, of dealing with it. And finally, even if companies remove content, very often they don't provide feedback about the removal so that the user that reported it doesn't know about what happened to the report that they had made. And of course, the more kind of gray zone the hate speech is, the more difficult it is to assess whether it is actually illegal or not, the more likely for these companies to not do anything about it. Uh, so what are the expectations of uh, mi minority or vulnerable groups when it comes to self-regulation? And I think that there are three keywords that are crucial here, quick, transparent, and accessible procedures. Um, and I think these are important clearly because these are the three things that uh, other solutions, that is, public authorities are not providing. Uh, so what do, you mean by, what do I mean by quick? Um, if it takes months and years of litigation to remove content, that will be not something that, the, these, that these groups will be content with. You want the content to be uh, removed, uh, uh, to be uh, at least flagged as hate crime quickly, um, 
in, in, a, in a decent amount of time so that you can actually see that something is happening. Transparent, transparency in terms of outcomes, you know, what were the content that were reported, what were the content that were removed, transparency about the, the procedures uh, that, that are taken, what are kind of legal information is taken into consideration when uh, making those assessments. And finally, accessible. Reporting should be easy for the users, just as easy as it currently is for reporting it to companies. If there is self-regulatory bodies, the reporting should be also part of the platforms themselves and don't expect users to go to other platforms and then take screenshots, etc., which is making the reporting very difficult. And accessible also in terms of costs, that it should be um, uh, ideally free, uh, but at least not... Um, not limiting in terms of costs. And my final comment is that these self-regulatory solutions should be not alternatives to other legal methods, but complementary to those. So that if there is self-regulation, it should not be used to kind of steer away people from re making reports officially also to public authorities, uh, maybe criminal prosec prosecutions or uh, civil litigation as well. And whatever solution of removal, for example, should not stop uh, being using that content in proof in those cases, which is currently very often the case. The content is removed, and then there is no way to then use um, uh, um, other uh, legal methods because the content is no longer available. And I will stop here. Thank you very much. So from a user perspective, you're raising a few, I mean, you basically summarized it in quick, transparent, and accessible, which I think is also what a few of the people already mentioned, like, okay, what are the procedures, and it should be clear, and it should be useful, as one of the concerns that also came from the group. Thank you for that. I'll leave the floor later on to also further respond and uh, strengthen. Can I give the floor to uh, Miriam maybe to contribute to this? Sure. So if you think about the concerns of platforms like YouTube, where I come from, what we want to do is to be able to appropriately address threats like hate speech, get ahead of them while remaining open. And I think it's worth just saying why that openness is important. It's because these platforms have opened up and enabled uh, major opportunities for expression and belonging, uh, culturally, artistically, for news, for all sorts of educational content. And so remaining open is extremely important to us. Um, and to appropriately address those threats while remaining open, I think we need a few things. So one, we ourselves need a set of clear policies and guidelines at the same time that we need appropriate legal frameworks. So both liability regimes, but also, um, and this is to your point, on definitions of hate speech that are clear uh, so that where we operate in different government, uh, different countries, we can appropriately uh, respect the local law. Um, as Tamash said, we need a system of notice that is user friendly. Uh, and then on our side, we need a robust, robust system of enforcement. For us, that's been a mix of people and machines. And I can speak later about where the tech has been able to help us in an area like hate speech, but actually the tech uh, is imperfect, especially in a place where you have a lot of nuance and context like hate speech, so there are real limitations there. We need time to make the appropriate decision, and here we particularly worry about provisions and regulation that suggest a fast turnaround time backed up by large fines. We think that inappropriately incentivizes the over-removal of content, so we need time to make the right decision. And we need access to experts, so experts from the NGO community, from uh, the academy and others. And then I think we need ways to deal with gray area content appropriately. Um, at YouTube, we implemented a system. We previously had two options. We could either remove a piece of content when we found it or leave it up. Uh, increasingly, we found there was content that came close to violating our policies or close to violating laws, but did not. So we introduced a new system where we could limit certain features. Uh, in other words, we could limit the ability for the content to be recommended by the algorithm. We could limit the ability for users to comment or to share. And we felt that that was a way to strike an appropriate balance between expression where people could access content that um, they may disagree with without uh, unduly spreading it. And then finally, I'd say we need better systems of transparency. And I think we've all gotten better about that. We've long had transparency reports 
where we report on content governments have referred to us for removal, and increasingly as platforms, we've been publishing our own reports around our community guidelines, what decisions have we made, in what cases, and what results have there been. Um, and I think we'll have time later to talk about a few of the examples, but let me just list them. So Tomas mentioned the European Commission's hate speech code of conduct, and I'll just say uh, we were one of the companies that got feedback from NGOs like Tomas's that we were not providing appropriate feedback to NGOs that flagged content. So they felt their flags came to us and they didn't know what happened to it. In response, we developed a new tool, a, a dashboard that lets any user, no matter whether you're a trusted flagger or not, see what's happened to your flag. I think that's a really positive outcome of that, uh, of, of what the commission was able to foster. We heard the feedback and we were able to, um, to bring a new tool to bear. The second is the NetsDG, which has a provision, this is the law in Germany, around hate speech and other illegal content. And it provides the opportunity for for companies to refer content to a separate self-regulatory body that can issue uh, opinions and, and sort of rulings about whether the content is illegal or not under German law. Those uh, decisions would then be binding on companies. Um, we have decided that we will work within that self-regulatory framework and more to follow on that in, in 2019. Maybe. Yes, sure. <clears throat> I, I don't want to repeat <coughs> too much because we have and we share uh, similar approaches that we also have rules. I encourage you to uh, look at them. You can uh, Google uh, Facebook community standards as the easiest way to find them. Anyway. Uh, they are, uh, they are, you might think they are quite long, but because we put everything on the table uh, last spring, so you can definitely have a look. You will see uh, our criteria on hate speech, on bullying, our definition of, of terrorism. So you might disagree with it, but at least it's there, and we can have a debate, and you can provide us feedback. It's uh, very important that we are transparent towards uh, the community of users. Um, <coughs> What I want to add is, uh, and especially in that week where we celebrate multi-stakeholderism, it's in our vision today is that it's a chain of uh, responsibility accountability. Like we can't be responsible for everything that is on the platform, obviously, uh, and it's important that we are not alone to decide what should be or not on the platform. Like there is the first layer of what is obvious, like incitement. Nobody wants speech that calls for the murder of other people. But unfortunately, it's not that simple because you can have tons of conspiracy theories against Jews that are not clearly inciting killing them, honestly. But at some point, some guy in the world would just take a gun and go and attack a synagogue. So uh, it doesn't mean that Facebook is responsible. Like it's, it's, it's not that simple, but it's part of the equation. And so today, we really need to work with other people with various legitimacies, uh, citizen, experts, NGOs, but also government, uh, to really uh, see what is the best. Is it sometimes to uh, take down content, and that's, that's something we need to, to continue when, when we have to, or is it more education? Is it more counter speech? We do a lot uh, in these fields. Uh, many companies are, are joining efforts. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm based in Paris, so I'm, I'm only giving the, the French perspective on that. Uh, uh, when it comes to work with government, of course, uh, and President Macron the other day, uh, he, he draw these lines between the, the Californian model and the Chinese model, and, and so France and Europe should build something in between that will strike the right balance between uh, free speech and protecting uh, uh, users. So, uh, you probably heard that we are going to work with the French government on, on these issues. The, the plan is not to have French government people coming to the office and tell us what what we, we should do or what kind of content we should take down or, or even access data of users. That's not the plan at all. So the plan is really to uh, have a, a group of regulators joining a, a Facebook task force in order to have an intense engagement where we will show them what we do to combat hate speech. So uh, who are the people working on defining the policies? Uh, who are the people uh, 
uh, taking down content? Uh, who are the engineers working on AI and automations? Uh, because the feedback we had from government is, is that, especially in Europe, is that we are accountable to citizens, so can you please like show us a, a little bit more than when we have we have been asked of what about this, then we can say this company is doing its best effort to combat his speech online. So I can say it because you show me stuff that allows me to say that. Uh, so the code of conduct is definitely a good process with the testing. So this is a, like an innovation in a sense. Uh, and, and we need to try something new if we don't want things like the, the Nest DG in Germany, which we've been criticizing uh, the last months, because for us it's, it's not that efficient at the end of the day. It's not, it's not really allowing companies to, uh, to take down that speech online. And, it, and, and the weakness of this law is also that we have to decide by ourselves what is illegal or not, which is something we don't want to. So the, the, the plan is really to to give a role to uh, governments in Europe, so with it's France today, but maybe uh, we never know how, how far it can go, uh, to work together. And so these people can say uh, to others, especially to citizens, this company is doing its best effort or not. Uh, uh, we will never be able to take down like 100% of uh, contents that are causing uh, problems, to be honest, but we have to try. <laughs> Uh, to, to, to do better. So, uh, if you have any question on this initiative, I'm happy to, of course, to, to answer. I'm, I'm sure there will be questions, so I'll give that floor in, in a few minutes. Um, I just wanted to ask Jeremy if there was anything to add, because you already introduced a little bit the yeah. context, uh, and there were some concerns raised and questions. So maybe you have points to add, and then I'll try to wrap up. Well, one, I think <coughs> coherence in definition is important. I mean, this is really what the ECRI recommendation was trying to do from a, a European perspective, and it's a, a bit problematic, therefore, when you have perhaps the European Commission focusing only on certain aspects. And that comes to the question also whether you're only dealing with stuff that, which is criminal or hate speech which is not. So that, that, that's an area where it's important. Um, the issue of freedom of expression is fundamental, but it, it is, there is a difference in the world in terms of the balancing. And that, I think, therefore, has to be reflected in terms of how it's dealt with in, in, in different jurisdictions. But the importance of freedom of expression, I think, is that you need to deal also not only to protect those who are the targets, but also to ensure that freedom of expression, which is legitimate, is protected itself. And the danger of overreaction, I mean, getting it wrong in terms of whether this is hate speech or not, you need some, in your self-regulatory scheme, you need some possibility of appeal against decisions so that the people who are accused of using hate speech actually can vindicate themselves if that, in fact, that's not the case. Um, and then that, I think, also comes back to the question also of training of those who are involved in doing the self-regulation because they need to understand what is hate speech and therefore different kinds of training depending upon the context in which you're talking about is, is also important. Thank you. I think listening to the various inputs, I think there's a few uh, trends that are, are emerging which I think address partly also what a uh, few people have been mentioning in the, in the, in the room. Um, I mean, I think the call for transparency, the call for clear definitions, that is, that, that is clearly there. I think what is interesting from the, what's happening in France is where there's like, companies have an internal process of assessment. And there's actually, this is an effort to, to give transparency in this and, and to seek cooperation with regulatory bodies or others to actually look up to this. So this is an interesting development to see how can this actually address the need for a democratic society to have a transparent, clear system that people understand and then also maybe give feedback to so that we can address needs of quick process but also tr feedback on the decision making in the channels. But then, so that's an interesting development and I'm very curious how this is going to play out in France. I think the next question is the grey zones. I think as a few mentioned, people mentioned, some of the stuff is very clearly excitement and maybe with transparent protocols that can be addressed and we can trust companies or we will follow the companies and well, through the code of conduct, this feedback loop is there. But this gray area, this gray hate speech, what can we do there? And I think the, the NetsDG, the self-regulation model that's been there promoted is actually trying to bring it a bit away from the companies and bring it into another 
Rome where maybe there's this possibility for more light, and you mentioned this already. Do you want to maybe explain a little bit more the idea there? Because I think this is an opportunity, no. actually. Um, yeah, maybe let me step back and explain a little bit more about the NETS DG. So the NETS DG says that companies um, that have above a certain user threshold, in this case 2 million users in Germany, uh, must remove flagged illegal content and illegal hate speech content within 24 hours if that content is quote-unquote obviously illegal and in seven days if the content is not obviously illegal. It then further gives companies an opportunity to avail themselves of a self-regulatory scheme of their design certified by the, the German government as appropriate uh, where we can extend even that seven-day turnaround time by referring a gray area case to a self-regulatory body. In this case, we'll work with a group called the FSM, which we've worked with in the context of child safety, and we'll expand that work um, under the NETS DG. And, um, and, you know, once we sort of figure out what that scheme will look like, you'll be able to see what the mechanism is, who staffs it at the FSM, what kinds of decisions they render, but we do hope that it will give us some clarity about specific cases that we see on our platforms and as they apply under German law. The benefit for the platform is that whatever decision the FSM reaches is binding on us and we cannot then thereafter be fined under the NETS DG if a court later finds that the FSM was wrong. So actually the self-regulatory body issues binding rulings and, um, but it also inures a company from liability if, if a court later rules otherwise, in other words. So I think it'll be an interesting model and we'll see, um, we'll see how it works in practice and I think we'll need some time to, to evaluate that. There's one other, if I may, that I wanted to discuss, which relates to the European Commission Code of Conduct. I think this is an area where we could do more to get into the nuance of gray area content. So Tomas will know, at the end of the exercise, the Commission puts out a very nice report that says how each of the platforms did uh, under a set of metrics and categories, turnaround times, removals, and feedback. And I think you know, they, they do a really nice job at the Commission of explaining the process that NGOs flag and refer content and companies <coughs> remove. But often what's lost is this headline that says companies removed on the whole in the last cycle 70% of the flagged content. At YouTube that number was 75%. Often the response is, well, why did you miss 25%? Why did you miss the 30%? And that's the sort of, that's the, I want to make a correction there. <laughs> you know, the standard isn't 100% removal of the flagged content. The standard is appropriate decisions. And so I think what would be worthwhile is looking at those areas where we didn't remove content to see, well, where was, you know, was it a failure of enforcement on the platform? Was it, uh, or was it a gray area content where lawyers and companies can, can disagree with NGOs, and I think that's a really interesting area worth exploring. Yeah, that I think is an interesting uh, remark, which is we, which also addresses some of the needs that were expressed by the rest of the, uh, the people here, that it needs to be transparent and we need to be aware of when and why certain content is deleted. And sometimes it's also fine that a report is not deleted, but then we need to know why. Mm -hmm. And I think these, uh, looking at numbers doesn't give the whole answer, and I think that's <laughs> Uh, the NETS DG, the first report, also is a lot about numbers, but we're actually not quite sure if this has led to over-deleting or not, because we actually don't know what the content is that's been deleted, or we don't know enough what that is. So there's an interesting challenge here of how do we gain transparency, because it's not only about numbers. Absolutely. Um, I promised I would give the floor also to uh, uh, the other speakers in the room, so uh, please, uh, I see already a hand. I wanted to pick up on something that was said earlier about uh, comparing the internet to a restaurant. <clears throat> and I think this, this brings up a, a much more serious problem, which is that we, we, we see a lot of people with different models for the internet, <clears throat> and they just port over the policies developed for those other settings. A lot of times when we talk about hate speech, the model in people's heads seems to be television and newspaper, 
the, the assumption is people are saying something and thousands or hundreds of thousands of people are hearing it. <clears throat> but most of the things that people post on the internet are more like email that might go to two or three people. I mean, it, 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 for me, it's much more like a diary. If you actually look at Facebook pages, particularly people who create private groups on Facebook, this isn't a mass medium. And yet we're assuming that we have to use the kind of rules that we have for newspapers and television. And I, I, I really think there's, there's a need to challenge this idea that the internet is something that needs to be tightly self-regulated or regulated because it gives everybody a mass, meet, a mass audience. It's just not happening for a lot of the material that people are posting. I mean, we wouldn't expect <clears throat> the government to come in and tell email providers that they have to filter every email just in case somebody says something hateful to an audience of two or three or five people. So there's, there's a whole spectrum here and I, I, really, I really cringe when I see this model of the newspaper used for the entire internet. And I also worry a lot about the small companies. You mentioned NetsDG, which at least tries to say this only applies to big companies. But in other countries, a new social media platform would be squashed like a bug because they wouldn't be able to provide the kind of services that you provide. Considering time, what I want to do is grab a few of the, uh, the ideas and responses and then also give the panel uh, as much possible. Thank you. Uh, based on our experience with uh, over 6,000 reports which are related, directly related to hate speech, violence, 99% uh, of them are just self-regulated. We've done everything by our organization as NGO. Only maybe two or three reports we sent, we have sent to law enforcement because it was close to crime issues. Uh, and also in our work, uh, the biggest problem is uh, to work with the YouTube and Facebook. Uh, you don't know when you can get answer. It looks like a weather report. Is it raining or not? Who knows? So uh, it's the same situation with the YouTube and Facebook. YouTube, uh, can get a report only from the government bodies or law enforcement. We are NGO, what we can do? Just send reports, not, no. Facebook, you can just send report from private person or private page or through the NGO page. You, you can get just a formal uh, answer, okay, We've got your report. Thank you. We will give you answer. So uh, the, the biggest problem is uh, how you can uh, react on a hate speech report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very short, please. Uh, just to pick up on Mike's point that, it, that the internet is not, does not, or the, the platforms do, should not be held to the mass publishing model of newspapers or television, nor should we use the model of the telephone. It's, that's what makes this difficult. It's a new thing that doesn't fit these historical models. We would posit that the, probably the uh, major opportunity for government is at the front end in education if we're trying to really get to self-regulation, the lack of the boundaries, uh, that the cultural boundaries to prevent this kind of thing when we're in person, uh, <coughs> lets these sorts of things out and having a better understanding at younger ages of the effects of uh, speech on others, uh, I think is uh, something that the government can do. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask, uh, Thomas, maybe you would like to respond to one of the inquiries and maybe the others also like to ask about the other two points. Yeah, I think I fully agree that the internet is not one thing. There are various platform that, platforms that have very different types of content, very different reach. Um, what m our experience is focusing mostly on social media platforms that is, you know, where people share content but there is a 
body that's actually providing that platform, such as Facebook or, or YouTube, in which case I think the responsibility is very clear for uh, maintaining the community standards by, by the platforms themselves. Of course, it's very different when it's just you know, hosting some, some other um, uh, content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think that, that there is um, room, for, room, room for improvement for all the companies. Um, and I fully agree with the difficulties in the monitoring. What is reported? Um, it's not very clear what is reported, and then you know the monitoring exercise should should be improved on that. And I, I I fully agree with your content. The only way to assess how the companies are doing is to actually see what were reported and when, then what what's the result of the outcome. And of course, it doesn't have to be a print publications of thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. But these platforms allow for making transparent those content that were reported and then what happened to them. And then people can go and check what happened to those reports. Well, let me just quickly say, um, anybody can flag content on our platform, so happy to sit and, and walk you through it. It's not just for governments and law enforcement. So any user anywhere can click the three dots on a video and report abuse. Uh, we also have the system of trusted flaggers that can report in bulk. Uh, and then we have the new user dashboard that will let you see what's happened to those flags. So let's make sure to, to help you with that. Just wanted to say one thing. Um, Jeremy had mentioned a system of appeals. So I neglected to say we also have that. So if you feel your content has been improperly removed by uh, YouTube, then you can appeal that decision and we will re-review it. And I agree, it's quite important. Thanks. I know um, that we... The same. Uh, sorry. No, the same. <laughs> <laughs> But just to add also that it's the criteria of uh, prevalence is also interesting that to focus on content that, are, that have a, a widespread instead of focusing on just a few, uh, uh, a very limited audience, sorry. It's, it's for us a way to, to improve things. Thank you. Due to time, I need to wrap up here. I think this is only the beginning of a discussion over self-regulation and hate speech. I mean, there's two practices, developments now with the NetCG in Germany and in the France context, which I think probably opens up for us to reconvene next year to continue the discussion and see a little bit our experiences from the last year here in Europe. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions. And the report will go online uh, within 24 hours so you can read back the discussions. Thank you. If you are, want to see the, the accurate policy recommendation shorthand is on your table. There's more copies at the back. And if you want the full publication, there's a few copies at the back.